All right, welcome everyone. I see we've got some attendees here. Um, yeah, Lynn, Stella, hi. Um, welcome everyone to Cooking Up a Cookbook. Uh, my name is Lauren Korn. I am the director of the Montana Book Festival. Thank you for joining us today and a big old thank you to our collector's edition sponsor, Whitefish Review, for supporting us and in doing so, supporting contemporary literature in the American West. We're really excited to welcome Stella Fong and Lynn Donaldson Vermillion to this year's virtual festival. Um, but first, I want to take a couple minutes to take care of some uh, housekeeping. Um, we'd, like a, we'd like to welcome you as attendees to submit any questions you have for Stella and Lynn um, via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You'll notice that there's both a Q&A and a chat function. The chat function is for you, uh, the audience, to chat amongst yourselves. We'll also be dropping some links in there to buy um, uh, flavors under the big sky uh, to donate, um, but that, that chat function is for you. The Q&A, um, if you wanna submit questions to Stella and Lynn, that's where you'll do it. Um, Colin Johnson is on hand behind the scenes to read those questions. Um, they'll make sure that they're seen, don't worry, and they'll relay those to uh, Stella and Lynn, and those will be answered at the end of the conversation. Um, this event in particular is going to be a little bit different um, than our others. After I introduce Lynn and Stella here in a minute, we're actually going to play a pre-recorded video, and um, their conversation will begin after that. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce Stella and Lynn. Hi. Culinary instructor and author Stella Fong has cooking and certified wine professional certifications from the Culinary Institute of America. Her articles have appeared in uh, Edible Bozeman, The Washington Post, Cooking Light, Fine Cooking, Big Sky Journal, Western Art and Architecture, and the San Diego Union Tribune. Tribune. She is the author of Historic Restaurants of Billings and Billings Food and host of Yellowstone Public Radio's Flavor Under the Big Sky. Hi, Stella. Hi. Welcome Lynn everybody. Donaldson Vermillion is a Livingston, Montana-based photojournalist whose appetite for adventure and thirst for travel have her roaming throughout the Rocky Mountains, shooting and writing about sugar beet festivals, Catholic burgers, wild game cook-offs, and the absolutely best places to eat pie. Founder and creative director of the Montana food and travel blog, thelastbestplates.com, you can find her stories and images in National Geographic Traveler, Savor, Travel and Leisure, Food and Wine, Sunset, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and many other national publications, as well as thefoodnetwork.com. Welcome, Lynn, and welcome you both. Thank you. Thank, thank you so <laughs> Excited much. Excited to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, yeah, that was a long is, intro. Sorry, but welcome. Yeah. You guys this will talk been, soon. <laughs> yeah, this has been a great opportunity because Lynn and I, I think, have been partners in food for many, many years and, you know, work together on Last Best Plates. So, again, appreciate this opportunity because this definitely had just kind of evolved. And thanks to Lauren and all her brilliant creativity. But this cookbook is just been, as I said, it's almost a culmination of some of the efforts that Lynn and I have put together over the years. And it is um, an inspiration from the 21 years that I have been here in Montana, you know, learning about new ingredients and learning about the bounty. And then also the whole uh, homage to uh, my Flavors Under the Big Sky radio show. So it's been a great opportunity. The book has 80 recipes. So, um, and Lynn, of course, made every dish just really, really beautiful. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> there, was e so, there was easy to shoot. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is, we're just gonna really jump right in. We have a video that we put together. It starts with a demonstration of one of my favorite recipes, which you found on the link um, when you kind of zoomed in for the rhubarb raspberry polenta cake. It's one, and cake's always my favorite thing to eat. So this was a combination of rhubarb that appears in my garden uh, every year at the right time. And so let's jump in the video and it's about 30 minutes. Enjoy and Lynn finishes off with tips about photographing. And we'll come back after that. I'm Stella Fong, author of Flavors Under the Big Sky, Recipes and Story from Yellowstone Public Radio and Beyond. 
with local harvest and global interpretations. This book is made up of 80 recipes. It's inspired from my show, Flavors Under the Big Sky for Yellowstone Public Radio, but it's also recipes from the 20 years that I have lived here in Montana under this great big sky. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna make the rhubarb raspberry polenta cake, which is one of my favorites uh, as far as desserts go. Love cake, but at the same time, we're gonna bring in Lynn Donaldson who took the photographs for this particular cookbook and she took my favorite photograph in the book. So after we get this done and I show you how to make this cake, we're gonna go outside and Lynn's gonna show you how to get that perfect photograph. So what we're gonna do is start with a springform pan. Love these pans because you can pretty much separate them and they can come back together. Uh, put that back there. And what I have is I've cut up a piece of parchment paper to nine inches and we're using a nine inch pan here taking some butter, which has been softened a little bit at room temperature. And we just take that and we spread that across the bottom to keep things from sticking. And I find that this also glues that piece of parchment paper on so that when we get the cake all baked up, it's easy to come out of the pan. So we'll just keep spreading that across and make sure it's even on the sides. And like I said earlier, you can take this piece of parchment, put that in there. And just put it on the bottom. And we'll set this aside. Now, we're gonna put together the rhubarb and the raspberry. One of my favorite things in springtime is that indication of spring. Rhubarb starts coming out from the ground and those leaves that have that red kind of green color comes out and it just kind of says, hey, spring is here. And finally that snow that here in Billings when we have sub-zero temperatures and the wind is blowing is finally gonna calm and we're gonna have a chance to emerge in the summer and emerge into the time when there's a bounty of vegetables in the garden and my husband has actually taken on that duty of being the gardener in our house so he tends to all the growing in our garden so what we have is we have these big gorgeous leaves and i get these great plants uh, from the, the rhubarb and i'm going to cut off the leaves and we unfortunately have to get rid of the leaves because they're poisonous we actually can't eat them and as you will see later i have a friend who actually uses the leaves to imprint cement or concrete and she makes these gorgeous leaves and these also make great placemats i guess for when you're either doing appetizers or something like that but we don't eat them so what we're going to do is take our rhubarb and we're going to cut these half inch slices here Let me scoot this over and the key is not so much that it has to be perfectly half inch it's just that you want the pieces to be about the same size so that they bake evenly uh, in the oven when the cake is cooking so you don't want a piece that's four inches long and one that's half an inch long you want them to be even in size so what we need is we need about two cups so i'm going to have to cut up just a little bit more and again the thing about rhubarb is it just comes in these different sizes you can get a really big size or you can have these smaller ones and you just cut them up until they're just even size. What I find with rhubarb is that in the book, I also have a recipe for rhubarb chutney, and I also have one uh, that I add to the summer harvest roasted tomato sauce. So you add a little rhubarb to tomatoes with onions, with some garlic, and some olive oil and you stick it in the oven you just bake it all together so right here we have two cups of the rhubarb 
And we're gonna add this to the bowl here, along with some fresh raspberries. And the reason why I put these two together is because, again, these are those indication that spring is here and that we're finally emerging onto great harvest. So three tablespoons of sugar. And then we just mix this all together. And then the sugar just infuses in because the rhubarb tends to be very sour. And so this sweetens it ever so slightly. Uh, it's not a ton of sugar, but just enough just to get that sweetness in there. All right. So what we're gonna do is mix the flour together for the batter for this recipe. And what we add to this particular recipe is that we're gonna combine almond flour and this is one cup of almond flour. And if you, you can buy it at the store, but if you don't want to do that, you can certainly take some raw almonds, blanch them. That means just bringing up some water to a boil and just letting them sit in there for a couple minutes and the skins just fall off. And then you put this uh, in a food processor and just combine that all together. Again, you don't have to take off the skins because if you just leave the skins off, you kind of get a rustic uh, almond flour. And of course, the lighter flour is gonna be uh, certainly fluffier, uh, gives you a fluffier result, and then the darker will just give you a denser, thicker re result. So I've added one cup of flour, and there's three tablespoons of cornmeal. And I use the finer cornmeal that people use for either making a batter or adding things uh, to just lighten uh, what you fry up. So what we've added is there, and then we have a teaspoon and a half of baking powder and, that, and a little bit of salt, a touch, a quarter teaspoon of salt. And we're just gonna mix this all together and make sure everything is nicely combined. All right, we'll set that aside. All right, now we're going to put together the butter with the sugar. And so we have butter that's going into this mixing bowl. And then we're gonna add a cup of sugar. And I'm gonna use the flat paddle of the mixer. Put that in there. Snap that in there. And then just turn on the speed slowly. And then as the butter comes together, we're just gonna increase the speed. And some of the hint for being able to whip this all together is I will take the butter and pull it out of the refrigerator about half an hour before we're ready to use it. And we're gonna do this for about three minutes. And this is almost like the base, the magic of the cake, you know, butter and sugar. Can't get any better than that as far as putting a cake together. So what happens is as this comes together, the butter kind of comes together onto the paddle. And then as it gets fluffier and fluffier, the butter starts covering up the side of the bowl. And I'll just increase the speed a little bit more so that we can incorporate a, a little bit more air into this. All right. I'm gonna stop this just a little bit, just to scrape off some of the butter from the paddle. Get that back in, and I'm gonna slide some of this off the side just to get that back into the middle of the bowl. And turn this back on and let it just beat away. I'm going to bring
bring this down. We're going to scrape off some of this butter here. And release the paddle. And get all that good stuff, good butter and sugar off the paddle itself. I'll just show you that that's kind of stuck to the side so we're going to scrape it a little bit off here get that back in and it snap back in and I'm going to put in the whisk attachment here slide that in there that back together and then we're going to turn this back on slowly at first I'm going to break in one egg let that incorporate speed that up a little bit Whipping up in there, fluffy, starting to turn slightly yellow. I'm going to slow it down just a little bit again, and we're going to put in our second egg. And I'll speed that up. the magic of butter, sugar, and eggs just all coming together and forming that base for this incredible cake. I'm going to stop it just a little bit. And we're going to scrape off the sides just to make sure all that butter and sugar get in there and get whipped up. And turn this back on to a slow speed and put in that final egg and a little vanilla extract and turn that speed back up and I'm going to talk about the vanilla extract just a little bit this is from my friend Margaret Thorndall and what she gave this to me back in 2015 and it's vanilla beans with rum, and it's just been soaking and infusing all this really wonderful flavor in there. And I use it all the time. I just replenish it, add more rum, throw in some more vanilla beans. So it's a real treasure to have in my pantry. We're going to bring this back down, and I'm just going to scrape this just a little bit to make sure everything is incorporated. A lot of times the butter tends to settle in on the bottom. And you know, even when you're doing your batter, you just want to make sure that everything is in there together and mixing up. So we'll turn this back on. And let that just spin around and around. All right. And we just want to get a lot of the bigger lumps out and make sure that you have more of a smooth, kind of homogeneous mixture. All right. Bring this back down. And I'm going to scrape one more time. And I think we're almost there. Bring it back up, and on again we go. And then we're going to turn the speed back down, slow that back down, and we're just about ready to add the flour. So I make sure it's all mixed up. And then we slowly pour this in. As it's mixing, 
And we just want to blend it until it's just mixed. Turn it up just a little bit. And it doesn't take very long at all. So we're going to bring this down. I'm going to scrape off that batter. Make sure everything gets in here. I'll get the bowl off. And I always find that it's always just easy if we just kind of slap that attachment, that whisk on the side, and we get most of it off. There you go. Take that. All right. all right. And then just make sure we get all our batter. Grab the prepared pan. Get that in there. And it's nice and thick. So you have to just spread that into the pan. And we just make sure that we spread this all off to the edges here. A lot of times what I like to do is I almost want to make it higher on the outside so that we have a, almost like a trough to hold the raspberries and the rhubarb once it goes in here. So again, just spreading and getting making sure that it's pretty even. I love this cake. It's super rustic and with the polenta, cornmeal in here. It's reminiscent of those Italian cakes that you'd get in Italy, and it just gives it just a slight bit of texture and thickness to it. So we'll make sure that we get all of the batter off here. And we take the raspberries and pretty much Pour it into the middle. And then what happens is when the cake bakes, the batter pretty much almost comes up and swaddles the rhubarb and the raspberries and just wraps it up almost like a blanket and a little bit of the rhubarb and raspberries just peek through and it's just ever so pretty. And just, you know, since we're talking about the cookbook, what I usually like to do at this point is you want to somewhat think about what the end result is gonna look like. So I do move a few berries around and do all that. But I always love the natural photos that come uh, for photographs or the pictures. Um, and they just don't get finesse like they used to um, in the old fashioned way. So we're just gonna stick this in the oven. But before I do, a lot of times, because there's so much butter in this cake, it ends up melting and some of the butter tends to seep through. So I'll take a little piece of aluminum foil and just put it underneath. So just in case it doesn't get all over your oven. So we're gonna put this in a 350 degree oven and cook it for about, oh, an hour to 10, hour, 10 minutes or so. So let's put it in the oven. All right, an hour and five minutes, 10 minutes have gone by and we're gonna pull this out of the oven and it just looks beautiful. The raspberries and the rhubarb are just showing and peeking through that batter that's just kind of grow, swaddled over the rhubarb and raspberry. So let me just lift this and we'll just slide that on there. So we're gonna let that cool for about 10 minutes and then we'll go in there and release it from the springform pan. So 10 minutes have elapsed, and we're just gonna take a knife and gently run it around the edges here. 
we're going to release the outer ring of the pan, lift it, and then you can see it's just right there, just perched on top of that. All right, so now we're ready to put the cake on the pedestal here. The beauty about these springform pans is if you don't feel like lifting the cake off the pan on the bottom, don't worry about it. You can just put it on the pedestal itself or on a plate and you can just put flowers around it or do something like that and just camouflage it. But what I'm gonna do is just take a big spatula and remember we had the parchment paper underneath so it should keep it from sticking. So I'm gonna press on it just a little bit here and just kind of run it along the edge and it should, as we go through, just lift. And sometimes what happens with this cake is that it's so full of juice from the rhubarb and from the raspberries that it's just a juicy cake. And we're just gonna see if we can just slide that onto the pedestal. And we've got it on there. And I don't usually worry about the parchment too much because once we cut that, we can just put it on the plate and it'll just release. So now we have the cake. It is ready to go. Um, I think I've cleaned off the edges. It's on the pedestal. We have it set. I'm gonna hand it to Lynn Donaldson for Million who photograph the recipes and the dishes in this book. And she is someone I have worked on with our Last Best Plates columns, and we have just known each other for years. She's taken photographs for Bon Appetit, for various cookbooks, for National Geographic, and she's gonna show you how to get that perfect shot. Well, the reason I chose this particular spot to shoot is because it's in the shade, and shade has like a very like beautiful, diffuse quality to it if you're shooting in the shade and the sky kind of acts like a giant softbox. The farther you away you are from the edge of where the shadow hits the sun, the the darker it's going to be. So if I really wanted to brighten this up, I'd move it closer to the edge of this shadow. But I don't really need to do that. This is really nice diffuse light and I'm gonna just keep it here because I kind of wanna play off these textures. I also like that, that this is a neutral color and this is a neutral color. Um, they're not gonna compete with the dessert and we also chose just to bring out the red and the berries and the rhubarb, we've, we've backed the the dessert plate with um, some leaves from the garden. I always love to show ingredients that are actually used in a dish when I can. Um, and then one of Stella's friends is an artist and she, she pressed actual rhubarb leaves into cement and made this beautiful, or plaster, I guess, and made this beautiful plate. And so that also will play off this. I'm not gonna shoot at, like if I were to shoot at an F22, that would make everything really in focus from the berries on top to the, the texture behind in the leaves. And I don't, I don't really want your eye to go all those places. I kind of want it to mostly focus on the top. So I've chosen to shoot at an F 6.3, um, which, will, which will give some depth of field, but not so much that it's distracting. Um, and when you use a shallower depth, depth of field, it kind of gives it a little bit dreamier quality um, than if you stop down all the way, which is also why I don't really like to shoot food at an F22 too often. I also just want to say that if this were meat, I would be shooting it in the bright sun because meat is brown or you know, gray, brown, kind of like not super exciting. And a kiss of sunlight can really add a lot to meat. Also, um, this rhubarb is starting to wilt and that's okay because it's not the main part of this. You're, it's not, it's not going to matter in this shot. But if I were shooting something that needed vibrant rhubarb, I would have stand in rhubarb and then I would also have fresh cut ready to put in at the last second. Because when you're shooting food, you don't have a lot of time to mess around like in your setup. Um, so yes, we've got our nice uh, neutral background and our f-stop chosen. And I often, I like to shoot food vertically. Like when I say vertically, I mean portrait as opposed to landscape. And this was a vertical book. Um, I've shot other books that were horizontal and that kind of threw me a little bit. I tend to shoot for food vertically um, because I feel like 
it looks most natural. Like whenever you're cooking or 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 um, eating, like I feel like your field of view is more vertical than horizontal. And so it's just a little bit more natural to my eye. And so I'm gonna frame this up vertically here. And I've already um, done a few tests and, and I think I have my light right. Um, and I do. Um, I'm, this is a glass plate and glass can be kind of tricky. I'm watching reflections here. There's some reflections on the right side of the plate that if I, if I like stand here, there they are. But if I hover forward slightly, they're gone. What I'm seeing right here too are, um, like I say, I'm getting this little spine of the rhubarb that's got some pink and it, it just adds a little interest to the image. So your eye kind of bounces around a little bit, but the strong focus is gonna be right on the center. So, so one of the biggest differences between an amateur photographer and a pro is that we shoot the heck out of stuff. I bet you that for each image, I, I take about 80. And you never, your first image is probably not going to be what ends up in the cookbook. I find you, you really have to feel your way into a shot. Um, just like if you're getting to know a person, like you, you just kind of have to first, you know, you take your first shot and then you start to notice, oh, there's a weird reflection on the right there. I better hover and, ooh, maybe I'm not too close. And, oh, that leaf, fold, leaf folded over a little. And so you keep shooting and moving. And I, I did a lot of this before we, we had the camera rolling. Um, but all of a sudden in your head while you're going, it starts to gel and make sense. When, when you see the shot, you know it in your gut. and and it quite often takes 40, 50 frames to get there. And with digital, the beauty of digital is you can just dump them in the trash. Back in the old days with film, it was a little more difficult and yeah, you, you, but I still shot, you know, overshot. Don't think of, don't, don't ever think you're gonna get the perfect image in 10 frames because it, it takes a lot of images to, to get a good image. Um, and also part of the, I always tell students who I speak to is that shooting is only 50% of the skill you need to, to be a food photographer. The, the rest of the um, work comes in post. Um, editing, just like knowing what images to keep and which to toss and which to work with. And I don't do over the top changes in Photoshop when I'm done shooting. I, I, I shoot for so many magazines and we're not allowed to do much more than treat um, Photoshop like it's in a dark room and you can tweak the exposure. I don't do a bunch with con, um, contrast. I don't ever crop. I always crop in camera. I never crop afterwards. I mean, it's very rare that, that I go in and crop. That That's also another way to tell a pro from an amateur. When you go in and start cropping stuff, you start really messing with proportions. It's just never a good idea. So if you don't like what you're getting, change lenses. Like I'm right now, I'm, I'm shooting at um, a 24 to 70 lens and I have it set at 70. Um, 70 millimeters and your eye sees it 50 millimeters. So it's a little more um, compressed than what your eye sees. But um, I, I often shoot food with a fixed 50 also. I would never shoot food with a wide. <laughs> I mean, it'd be very rare that you'd ever shoot a dish. Maybe if you were shooting a table, you'd use a wide lens, but don't use, um, I advise not to use a wide lens with food. Also, if you're shooting with your iPhone, put it on portrait mode. It just adds a beautiful, soft quality to it. And it, it um, you know how I was saying depth of field? It, it always uses a shallow depth of field and it just adds a, like the edges are soft and it just adds a really beautiful quality to what you're seeing. But, the, um, and then in post, like what I do mess with are the, the contrast and the exposure, I will tweak that. Um, sometimes I'll bump very slightly the clarity. Clarity is really weird to mess with. Um, but sometimes I'll bump it up a little bit. Like I know I will when I get into this because it's going to make every speck of powdered sugar crisp. And that's really going to help draw you, keep your eye on this top layer here. So that'll be really pretty. Um, and then uh, also another really nice thing sometimes to do with food in Photoshop is add a very slight vignette. Um, you know, just darken the edges a little bit. 
every once in a while it will work to make the vignette white and just lighten them a little bit it just depends on the dish and I, I can't state enough that when you're working with food you have to be fast and you also have to react quickly and you need to know um, like just when to like move on and just start something different but um, it's it, it's a challenge and I respond to the day like if this were a, an overcast day I don't know if I'd be shooting right here um, you just always have to respond to the light and the what the colors of the dish the colors of the plates you're using and that's that's another step that that maybe is the very first like um, when we actually shot this uh, for the cookbook, we had a v variety of platters and plates set around Stella's kitchen, and we would look. It's the artist um, Nancy would. We would look and put different colors with this, and that's how we discovered that this plate looked great with this rhubarb. Not only is it a rhubarb leaf, but just these golds and. Um, copper and greens just really played off with that really well so before you ever start you definitely want to get your dishes and um, you know napkins silverware whatever else worked out but I, I think we're we're pretty much ready to go um, taste this what do you think <laughs> gonna take it to Stella <laughs> so now we have one of my favorite cakes on a plate I've garnished it with some fresh raspberries Again, you know, this cake is so versatile that if you don't have raspberries or rhubarb, you certainly can add peaches or apples in the fall and just be super creative. So the final decoration, a dusting of sugar, just to finish it off, makes it really, really beautiful. And I can't wait. You've got the raspberries oozing out and juicy and the rhubarb. And it is just fabulous. Thank you for joining me. The recipe is in Flavors Under the Big Sky, Recipes and Stories uh, from Yellowstone Public Radio, or you can go to StellaFong.com. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Um, that was definitely a venture for Lynn and I, but um, really a lot of fun. So uh, Lynn talked about collecting the photographs and I wanted to kind of step in and talk about the stages of what we went through to get the book done. Um, from beginning to end, the book itself took about a year to do. So I think it's called seizing the opportunity. The opportunity came and it was a chance for me to put together a cookbook that I have thought about for you know many years of my life. So um, I just wanted to go through some of those uh, stages and uh, give you some suggestions. First of all, you have to have a collection of recipes. So I think that that's really, really important. Um, I have boxes and boxes of recipes. So. Um, I had some uh, like backbone as far as the recipes go and uh, had many of them on the internet. And plus, uh, when I went off to college, it was a collection of recipes from my dad who loved to cook. And so that is really, really important. So what happens is then you got to think about the theme. You know, what is it that you want to do to tie the whole book together. And of course, for me, I did have Flavors in the Big Sky, uh, Celebrating the Bounty of the Region for Yellowstone Public Radio. So in some ways that was the finding factor for putting this whole book together. And, and then from there, you have to somewhat look at, well, how do I divide this book up so that it is interesting and you can put your recipes um, in an organized format. And 
in this particular book, I decided to divide the book into the regions of Montana under the big sky, and then have a section where some of the uh, background recipes I had uh, would go into it, and then a final kind of pantry area where a lot of the condiments and sauces and spices all came together. So, you know, in some ways that's how that all got put together because when um, you do submit a proposal to a publisher, you do have to have it organized and have an intention for the book. So let me now just step into the recipes really briefly. Um, the head notes themselves make the recipes uh, more personal. So uh, certainly you have a story to tell or maybe some hints or, you know, some, some kind of uh, notes on what it, that recipe means to you. So um, certainly that needs to go in there um, to just personalize it, to make it so that it's more yours and you can relate to the reader or the cook. Uh, measurement format, uh, certainly you have to be consistent. I found that this is somewhat challenging because I tend to be more of a creative cook. So having to have exact measurements was um, a little bit more challenging, but you have to decide whether you want the format. For instance, do you spell teaspoons completely out or do you use the word tea and period or do you use TSP? So you have to have that format and then just be consistent throughout. Um, your instruction format, same thing. Do you shorten the instructions, meaning that you go preheat oven or preheat the oven? And many times that also depends on the publisher and how many words you have. So, you know, again, consistency, keeping that uh, together. Cook's notes, many times um, it's nice to have a hint uh, to the reader and let them know as to what they need to do to successfully uh, complete the recipe. So um, finally, test the recipe over and over and over, meaning um, it's nice to kind of distribute them to friends. Um, my sister, my friends, they were really, really helpful because it's somebody else looking at the recipes and testing them and making sure they actually work in their own kitchen. So test over and over and over. All right, timeline. Um, we had talked about this whole thing elapsed over a year. Um, I submitted my proposal in November. Um, basically, uh, it was just one that I think resonated with the publisher and the turnaround time was actually pretty quick and I feel really blessed and fortunate, but I will admit that I had a relationship with Arcadia Publishing. I had done uh, historic restaurants and Billings food with them. so. The turnover was the proposal was accepted uh, within a week. And that meant that I had to kind of move forward. I was hoping I'd have the luxury of a few months to kind of think about it. Um, but again, we have the holidays and then we moved into the new year, January to June, go to your collections of recipes and start outlining, picking out your favorites. This book had over 80 recipes. So um, I had to somewhat collect them and then make sure that these recipes don't overlap each other, you know, that you're getting a fair representation of what you want in the book. So, you know, that elapsed over the several months. I tested and probably completed 20 recipes in a month, um, which may not sound like a lot, but it felt like a lot, um, just to make sure that everything came together. Um, finally, in July, we were organizing for the photo shoot. We're thinking about um, planning and backdrops. And Lynn had mentioned that too, you know, have your dishes ready, but also at the same time, think about the plating, think about how you want to present this recipe and how it represents um, what you want to do. And uh, August was basically organizing for the photo shoot. We shot the last week in August. So that meant that the weeks before was organizing the team. I am so blessed to um, have a sister and a brother-in-law who came in, a good friend who or organized um, my friends who volunteered to come in to the kitchen and cook. Um, I don't know if you remember when some of those last photos is that our kitchen was just filled with food. We were cranking through 20 recipes a day, um, and we shot for four days. So in my 
uh, realm here, I didn't have the luxury of doing a cookbook over several years or over several months. Um, so everything had to be done within that period of time. So that also meant that I had to live with certain things that maybe we might not think uh, was perfect, but it was so beautiful and it was good. So uh, September, we started reviewing the photographs and that is what Lynn brought up is that 50% of it is post-production. Uh, Lynn and I got together, she took probably 500 photographs of each image. So she kind of brought those down and then we sat down and with Photoshop went through the photos and kind of uh, adjusted them to where we thought we were happy and it represented the dish. Finally, October, I turned my manuscript in. And then January, February, March, um, I was reviewing the manuscript with the publisher and the editor there. Um, and finally, the last thing was the table of contents came together. Um, a lot of back and forth. I look at this as a blessing because this was definitely my COVID baby. Um, it was happening during the time when we were returning to the kitchens, but at a time where I felt like a cookbook, you know, why are we doing one? But um, certainly a blessing. Costs, of course, um, finally comes in, the cost of food. Um, it's one of those that that will be something that um, if you're doing a cookbook, it is something you have to take into consideration. Um, there are costs of, I had to buy the books. So certainly there are a numbers involved in that. So it's not a lighthearted venture, but something that you need to proceed forward with um, some planning. And I would say a little bit of dedication and, and uh, commitment to it. So um, I pretty much have kind of wrapped this up really quickly. Lynn, I don't know if you want to add to what I just said. Um, I guess I can leave it to questions. Uh, there are a couple things I wish I would have said in the video that I didn't, but I'll, I'll just be, I'll just be quiet. And then if, if someone else, if, you know, maybe if someone asks a question, I can weave them in. No, I feel like we still have a little time. Go ahead. If you have, oh, a, you, okay. yeah, go for it. Well, the, something I didn't really out state, but I, I thought was evident, but it probably wasn't, was the, the number one thing you'd want to do when, when you're shooting is scout first, because you have to be absolutely ready to go when that food comes out, because you really don't have time, very much time. Sometimes you'll only have a couple minutes, sometimes not even that much when you're shooting food. Um, so I definitely uh, went out and I walk around the house and I look at all the locations depending on the dish. So number one, scout. And then um, I did mention about like selecting your plates ahead of time. And I talked about color, but I didn't talk about shape. Shape is also really important, especially with the plate that you put it on. Like, do, are you gonna have it on a cake stand? Are you gonna have it on a round um, plate, a square plate, a rectangle? Um, and th so I didn't mention shape. And then also the shapes of your other things. Like even when I shoot food for a travel story in a restaurant, it, you're always building a shot. Like, and I almost think of it as tabletop photography and, and you know, the, the salt and pepper shaker and also surfaces like silver is reflective, glass is reflective. And sometimes it will add a sparkle that's nice, but sometimes the sparkle will be um, a distraction. So you know, maybe all you want to do is block sunlight from hitting it off camera, hitting a sparkle to tone it down. Or maybe you want to emphasize a sparkle, but just um, you always, you're the hero of any food shot is the plate, the food itself. And then you, you just build everything around it. Um, and then I, I took a few notes here. I have one more. Yeah, I definitely, uh, for your cookbook, I definitely bet I took 500 of each. Like I say, pros shoot the heck out of stuff. So um, don't ever feel bad about um, not getting it right away. I mean, it just, it doesn't happen. Um, and then in, and I, I'm a photojournalist mostly. So I work pretty quickly in the old days. I would have said plan on, and when I say old days, I mean film or slides and, and Polaroids and, and big lights. In the old days, I would have had to have lights on hand. I guess I had them on hand just in case, but um, it used to be like eight shots a day. And now you can get away with doing 20 in an hour if you're accustomed to doing it. I do this all day, every day. Like I, I go in and I shoot stories 
and I always have to be fast. So um, we did about 20 shots a day, but that's kind of unrealistic. Probably if you're just beginning to do this, you, you know, you kind of, um, it'll take a while probably to work up to that, especially if you want 20 really good shots in a day. And then in post, it, at one point I said, well, I don't mess with contrast. I don't mess with contrast if I'm shooting for a newspaper because we can't do that. But for a cookbook, I can. And I just, you got to be really, really careful with contrast, saturation, and vibrance in Photoshop. You can really overdo it and make it look weird. So you don't want your colors to look weird. And that's what happens when you start bumping the contrast or um, vibrance or saturation too much. Clarity, you got to be very, you got to use clarity really sparingly too. Like that, it, it really does enhance, like I say, that granular powdered sugar, you could kind of see every speck, but um, you, you don't want to go too far because it really, it makes, it makes the edges almost look like you drew them in with a heavy piece of chalk. So be careful with clarity, but it is nice to use a little bit. Um, and like I say, I mostly just mess with exposure and um, um, also vignetting. Vignetting can just be amazing because it it pulls your eye in a little more um, to, to work. Well, I guess I tend to focus in the center usually, but a vignette, a, a small one, if you, if you overdo it, sometimes you might want to hit feather a little bit. If you overdo it, it, it can look really kind of corny. <laughs> so you got to be careful with your vignetting too. But um, let me just see. Oh, and lenses. I, I talked a little bit about lenses and I said, I, one thing I didn't say is even before you ch bother to change your lens, just maybe move really close and see what you get. Move far away and see what you get before you change your lens. Cause maybe that's all you need to do is get closer and fill the frame and um, just test it, test it and see what it looks like. And um, anyway, those were just a few things I wanted to add. No, those are fantastic. Great, great hints. Um, and, you know, we really did go with a philosophy of just shooting natural food. So whatever came off the plate uh, from the kitchen went out. And the only probably rearrangement was, you know, Nancy Halter, who helped you out with everything. You know, she might move a few things um, with a tweezer or just make sure things were um, out of, you know, if it was out of place, they put it back in place. But, you know, that's really the only manipulation that we did. So, and I, um, sorry, go ahead. Uh, we have a few questions, but go ahead. Oh, good. Yeah, we, I mean, we have a question here. Um, uh, okay, did you come to the idea of the cookbook with the recipes already in place or did you do a lot of kitchen experimenting while writing? I think a lot of the recipes were already in place, meaning that they were, they were background recipes. Um, you know, they were inspired, you know, for instance, you know, I had the stew recipe um, and I had already been using red wine, but how better can it be than to use maybe Clint Peck's Yellowstone Cellars Barbera, you know, for the beef and bacon stew. And I had, you know, chocolate chip cookies in place, but then I added uh, things like the broccoles, espresso beans, and then the crickets from Belgrade Farms, you know, Belgrade, um, the Cowboy Cricket Farms. So it was one of those that they were inspired of many recipes were already in place, but you know, the background um, backbone was already there. So I'm now scanning. Do we have, okay. Uh, I'm just trying to see is, oh, okay. Here's another question. Any recommendations of doing a cookbook of family recipes? We are starting to collect recipes, Native American and Norwegian. I, I would say go for it, you know, um, it definitely a, 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 an area that I think um, Norwegian, of course, is becoming very popular of uh, the Native American. I think there's a lack of recipe books that are out there, uh, cookbooks. And I would say if it's something you want to do, you know, collect those recipes, put them together. And, you know, uh, if you're serious about it and you could um, have a collection, I, I would say go for it, you know? And, you know, certainly you have my email. I would say, you know, email me. I'd be happy to, you know, uh, recommend or uh, help you out. So let me see, is there another 
question. I think those are the other two. Any and anybody else that has a question, please um, uh, uh, chime in. And we have about five more minutes, and I'll just kind of look for questions. But um, let's see. I see one new message here. Oh yes, um, the, I think this one's is this one's for me. It, um, I think it's for you. Um, Lynn, do you have a preferred format proportions for cookbooks? I am working on a family memories cookbook with family picks as well as food picks. I wonder if you have any suggestions about format and sidebars. I shot a cookbook like this recently for my friend, Sally Ullman, and um, it's a book she did called Just Cook with Sally. And that the way that was laid out is amazing. She did family recipes, she wrote memories, she had um, um, family photos. And then I came in just fairly similar to Stella for four days and shot it. But the way that was laid out, there were lots of sidebars and, and the graphic designer who did that was amazing. She kind of specialized in magazine layouts. And um, that was a vertical foot, a cookbook. I, um, I worked on a cookbook with Sebring Davis, who um, was a project manager. Um, she knows all those proportions because I know that with print runs, it matters like how many pages exactly it is and the, the size it's cut. I don't, I don't know all those specifics, but if you wanna um, email me, um, my email is lynn at lynndonaldson.com and I can, um, um, give you a little bit more information on how the designer did the family cookbook I shot though she's down in Denver but she freelances and she's amazing and even if you just wanted to let, like look at a few of the layouts in Just Cook with Sally I think that that might be helpful for you because it was one of the best family cookbooks I, I, I've, I've ever seen and um, um, let me see here just yeah, um, again, it, I mean, and you can mix, you can mix and match verticals with horizontals when you layer a layout. Um, I hope I've asked, answered your question. I don't wanna take too much more time, but email me and I can give, I can give you more info. And it, I think that's, I thought there was another one for me, but it, there wasn't, sorry. And I'm wondering if I'm still in, am I in or not? Nope, you lost me. Here's one, where can I get a family cookbook published? Do you wanna, I, I have some ideas, but do you wanna go Stella? Am I in? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, um, yeah, my computer's kind of gone south a little bit. So I'm sorry, reread it because I've kind of lost the um, frame, please. Okay, so where can I get a family cookbook published? Oh, that's a good question. You may need to just go ahead, email me. Um, you know, there's different people with different formats and it's one of those, whether you self-publish it yourself, which I think Amazon is also doing that whole self-publishing thing, but um, email me at stellafong.com and let me um, get back to you on that one. So there are uh, other opportunities. I, I can tell you one for sure. Sweet, Sweet Grass Publishing, isn't that a division of Far Country? Yes. Yeah, That's they true. do. So I shot a cookbook called Gatherings that um, Carol Sullivan from Mustang K Kitchen in Livingston did. She self-published and she used them, Sweetgrass Press. And they have um, different levels that you can hire them to do. Like Carol chose to distribute the book herself, but you can even have them distribute if you want to. Um, they, ha they have a number of levels and they were so wonderful to work with. Um, and then I, I can look into if, um, I saw Rich Peterson ask that question. He happens to be a friend and colleague of ours on the last best plate. I know, I saw that. Yeah. Uh, Rich, I can tell you more. I can I can let you know who Sally used. I can't remember who put who shot just cook with Sally, but that that would be another great one too. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we're down to one minute. So I think I just want to close. Thank you, Lynn, for being a partner in crime to this. Um, Thank and thanks to you all out there for your support in attending this uh, seminar. So really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.
Hi, yeah. just jumping back in. Um, thank you both for being here. Thank you for that really beautiful video. Um, I think all those questions were really helpful, your answers. And thank you for giving people your contact information. It's always really nice to have um, a direct conversation with you too. Um, so thank you again, Stella and Lynn for joining us. And thank you audience members for attending this Montana Book Festival event. Um, I'd like to again shout out Whitefish Review one more time. Thank you for your sponsorship of this year's festival. As a reminder of the, to those of you um, who are watching, you can purchase Flavors Under the Big Sky, as well as books by other festival authors on Fact and Fiction's website as well at factandfictionbooks.com. You can also purchase Montana Book Festival merchandise at montanabookfestival.com. And while you're there, I urge you to donate so that we continue uh, we can continue virtual programming like this into the fall with our MBF Plus events. Again, thank you so much for joining us, Lynn and Stella. Um, talk to you all soon, I hope. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.